You boss, you boss, come on. You bossy. You boss, come on. You boss, you boss, you boss. We bred some of these 12 generations. Yeah, I started out probably in the 50s with them. Jackson County, Michigan was home to more than 50 dairy farms in 1973. Yeah, boss, yeah, boss. Come on. Veterinarian Alpha Clark took care of almost all of the herds. And we bred him back to uh, uh, one of the modern day bulls so we could see what the old and the new come together with. It was his life's passion and the reason why he was one of the first to realize in the spring of 1974 something was terribly wrong. Yep, I was there. Clark noticed the cows were sluggish, didn't want to eat. There was a drop in milk production and their hooves grew large and curled upwards. They could barely walk. But that wasn't the worst of it. I mean, I, I hate to tell you about it, it's awful. Stillborn calves, hundreds of them, many deformed. You have no idea what that eight year spell was like. It was, it was unbelievable. Trying to keep them alive. Hilda Green and her husband Alvin had a farm not too far from Clark's practice in Chase, Michigan. Something my husband always wanted to do was farm. And we were very happy. At 90 years old, Hilda still vividly remembers how their dairy cows began to change. They got so they was walking funny, their hoofs was growing bigger. As far as the liver... As a veterinarian, Alpha yeah, Clark decided he uh, needed to find out what was going on and began testing the cows. And I think we have to be very, very concerned about this right here. I, um was born and raised on a dairy farm. In another part of the county, 13-year-old Valerie Suzko was also noticing a change with her prized 4-H dairy cow. One of my favorite um, cows on our farm, her name was Ginger. I loved her to pieces. I mean, I would go and lay against her in the, in the stalls and we'd cuddle up and I'd just talk to her like she was my best friend. And she was showing the same signs of sickness, just like all of the cows on her father's farm huge bumps on their hip bones they had developed in it and then eventually it would just get so big it would pop open and white runny pus would come out. We were losing calves so quickly and it was in the winter time and our, our, my father would line up the dead animals along the, the wooden bunker sile and that still stuck in my mind. Um, some of them they were dead, some were alive. With nearly two-thirds of the dairy and beef farms affected in the state, it became obvious there was a connection. Let me see. You know, here it is, right here. And Dr. Alpha Clark helped discover what it was. Yeah. Still today. Oh, yeah, that's... In the back of his office, he keeps nearly a dozen boxes packed full of files with results of medical tests conducted by the University of Wisconsin as evidence of what happened. So these are all the farms that... Yeah, that I tested. See them? The test provided the proof. I mean, they're just deformed. The pictures, the evidence. What, half a calf? What is it? No, it's, that's the way they come. That's the way they come. All of the evidence pointed to Michigan Chemical, the main distributor of feed to the Michigan Farm Bureau. It took nine months for the state to confirm that workers mistakenly used flame retardant called Firemaster instead of the vitamin Nutramaster to mix the feed. The flame retardant contained a man-made chemical called polybrominated biphenyl, or PBB. And it was being fed to livestock all over Michigan. The human error resulted in the largest agricultural disaster in U.S. history. Thirty thousand cows, a million and a half chickens, and thousands of pigs were destroyed. More than 500 farmers lost everything. It was so devastating that it gained national attention. An article in Time Magazine called it Cattlegate. We had no income after that. If it hadn't been for the mailman uh, putting $20 in an envelope every month or so, 
we wouldn't have had nothing. The State Department of Agriculture was left with a problem of where to put the diseased livestock. What do you do with these cattle? They had to be destroyed. But they couldn't be destroyed and just buried on site because then you've got a contamination problem into your groundwater. Eventually, it was decided they would be taken to two separate landfills, the largest one in Kalkaska County. But the cattle and the farming industry weren't the only casualties from the PBB poisoning. When we continue, the disturbing revelation that families had been eating contaminated meat and dairy products for at least two years. So in 1976, I believe we were, our first blood draw was taking, taken um, at the farm. And now it was beginning to affect their health. By the time the Michigan Department of Agriculture discovered that PBB was being fed to livestock in 1975, the toxic meat and dairy had been consumed by nine out of every 10 Michigan residents for nearly two years. The Department of, um, of Health came in and took um, all the frozen meat that was in our, our freezer, in our big chest freezer, because they wanted to test to see if any of our chickens or swine or or our beef um, had the contaminant. And they did find it in our, our frozen meat. The health department quickly realized they had an even bigger problem on their hands. The health of an entire population who had been eating PBB. They didn't know what the chemical was or how it could affect the body. Meat and dairy products were immediately pulled from grocery stores and the state began one of the largest blood draws in the nation. So in 1976, I believe we were, our first blood draw was taking, taken um, at the farm. We had a nurse come out, and, and I remember that so well, and um, drew our blood. And the blood of 4,500 farm families and employees from Michigan Chemical. The purpose, to determine just how toxic PBB was, how many still had it in their blood, and ultimately, what health issues it would cause. My brother and I had the highest levels, but I think it's because we mixed the cattle feed, so we inhaled it. Valerie often wonders if her parents' early deaths from heart disease and thyroid complications were caused by eating meat contaminated with PBB, or if that's why her sister experienced several miscarriages. Dozens of families also reported early deaths from diabetes and occurrences of childhood cancer. All of those conditions were part of a study by the Michigan Department of Community Health that began in 1976. It's a material, it's a chemical that really wants to stay put. Uh, it's, not very, it's not water soluble, it's not going to sort of be shed by the body, it's going to store in the fat, and it's very happy to stay right there. David Wade with the Michigan Department of Community Health was part of the team that organized how blood samples were managed and tested. He explains that because PBB is stored in fat cells, that also means it stays in the body for decades. Fifteen years is the half-life. It's not, it doesn't mean that it goes away. It means that approximately half of it will be left in the body in 15 years. Which is a concern for future generations. And we do know that, um, you know, PBB can be passed along to offspring. It's passed through breast milk, resulting in a PBB toxicity to the child. In the 40 plus years since the discovery of the PBB contamination, there have been confirmed health problems. We know that it increases the risk of breast cancer slightly. We know that it affects the thyroid. The most disturbing is the finding that PBB accelerates the maturation of young girls born to mothers with PBB. The average age is around 12, 13, and uh, these, these, um, this part of the cohort was around 11, 11 years old. So was a pretty dramatic change. Sons born to PBB exposed mothers had three times the increase in hernias and water buildup around the scrotum. The discoveries open up even more questions about the effects of living with PBB. Are there other reproductive problems associated with PBB not only in uh, young, young women but in young men? Rich Sharp is one of those hundreds of children who ate contaminated food during that time. His family farm in Macosta County was one of the hundreds contaminated with PBB. When he was just nine years old, he had his first blood draw. 
all of a sudden there's these people and you're told to sit down at your kitchen table or the dining room table, hold out your arm and get ready to have some blood drawn. When we continue, the results of the blood tests on thousands of Michigan residents, confirmation that they were contaminated with high levels of the toxic PPB chemical. Now the Michigan Department of Community Health needed to find out what that meant for their future and that of their children. The results of Rich Sharp's blood test showed that he had 0 .003 PBB in his blood. 0 .001 is considered safe. His mother, father, and sister also tested positive for PBB, but their levels were lower. However, they had their own share of health problems over the years, which makes him wonder if PBB had something to do with it. There has been suspicion with my, um, with my oldest sister. Uh, she's 11 months older, uh, younger than I am, and uh, the problem that she had was with, uh, with uh, trying to have a baby. She only has one child, but uh, had tried multiple times and uh, had either miscarried or, uh, you know, never come to a full term or anything like that. So a lot of it is deep down inside of you, you, you know, you have that suspicion that it could be part of it. Rich would be 24 years old before his body rid itself of half of the PBB. For almost his entire life, he's been conscious of the fact that he has a highly toxic chemical in his body. You can't give blood. You're told not to give blood because of the contamination, because you don't know if it needs to be screened or whatever it is. So that's how I live the, my life up until the moment. You go to a doctor's, a doctor's place and you say, you fill out the forms and they say, well, what other additional information do you need? You say, I have PBB in my blood, and the doctor doesn't even recognize what you, what's dealing with. They're like, well, I have no idea what kind of issues that is or what kind of issues will come of it and stuff like that. So, oh, well. I mean, it's like you didn't even have a recognition with a medical physician at the time. It's why he continues to participate in the research, to hopefully shed some light on how the chemical affects human health. I'd like to just describe a little bit about the study and what we're going to do today. He's been a part of the study since it began. The second part is a blood collection, and from that sample we'll be able to determine if there is still detectable PBB in your blood today. In addition, Rich will also go through a urological exam and have his sperm tested. We're now looking at these men to see if there are fertility issues in them as well. Dr. Stephen Schrader with the CDC's Institute for Occupational Safety and Health examines the semen, looking for any indication that PBB has altered their DNA. Then I can take a single sperm track and actually see what was happening to it. That information will be shared with Dr. Michelle Marcus of Emory University, who has been involved in the study for 15 years and now heads up the second stage of research. It's important that we continue to follow these people and see whether the numbers change in the future. I am very concerned that we are seeing uh, health effects in the children uh, because in general children are more sensitive to toxic chemicals than adults are and uh, it's only by following them that we will know the true extent of, of what health effects might, might appear. Her concern is not only for the children, but for the future, and determining what health problems could lie ahead for those who have been contaminated with the PBB chemical for nearly 40 years. Well, my sister had um, several miscarriages, and um, my brother has a child who has, who has cancer. You know, it's hard. We really won't know for sure without following the, the participants a little bit longer because uh, cancer takes a long time to develop. This is the time period where we might be seeing uh, ca more cancers emerging. The second stage of research will also include neurological problems. Particularly neurologic problems of aging, um, uh, concerns about um, uh, dementia or um, memory problems. What I would really like is for this to never happen again. When we continue, the biggest question, how long will the research need to continue? 
as those involved in the country's largest PBB agriculture disaster grow weary. But you know, after you work 40 years and it's all gone, your dreams are gone too. The PBB incident has already affected two generations. The biggest question researchers are trying to answer now is how many more will suffer because of it. If we really do see effects in this, this generation of, of the children, then we well, have a concern about the grandchildren. And you know, how long will this be passed on from generation to the next? But that depends on the willingness of those who have been affected to continue their enrollment in the study. Valerie Suzko has become an advocate, not only participating in the research, but holding meetings and encouraging those with PBB contamination to join the study. But despite all of her efforts, she still has one question that will probably never be answered. You know, why did it have to take so long to discover it? I'm the bloom. Rich Sharp says he will continue for however long it takes. <laughs> but for many, it's still too painful. I don't, I don't hold no grudges against nobody. I don't let it get the best of me. To remember those days when they lost everything, only to learn it may have cost them their health and that of their children. Hilda Green lost three of her four children to health problems, including one to leukemia at the age of 50. But you know, after you work 40 years and it's all gone, your dreams are gone too. She no longer participates in the blood draws and research. At the age of 90, she says she's too old and too tired. Although, she keeps the thank you notes sent to her husband after the incident. They give her peace that sacrificing the livestock made a difference. Dear Mrs. Green, Mr. Green, thank you for your care for people in destroying your cattle. May God make up your lack from his bountiful store. As for the landfill in Kalkaska County, you'd hardly notice it today. The seemingly healthy field of country grass hides its dark past. And the sun has long since set on the PBB contaminated livestock buried beneath the soil. Waiting for research and time to reveal its true legacy. PBB has not been manufactured in the United States since the Michigan incident. In 1994, $4 million was awarded to the 22 affected farm families as compensation for the contamination. However, there has never been any retribution paid for the long-term effects on their health.